Right, you would arrived back in Cambridge. In 1984. Um, and if I was asked what the main theme of my professional life has been while I've been back in Cambridge, I think it's about working out all the consequences I can think of of the idea that communicating knowledge is always also making it. So that there's a very common idea which has initial plausibility but is in fact completely false, that what one's at as a scholar or researcher or whatever is working solidly backstage making knowledge, finding out new truths, making connections, and then subsequently somewhere else in a completely different way, all of this is going to be communicated. It's going to be communicated by publication, in teaching, in broadcasting, in exhibitions and so on. And I guess my experience over the last quarter of a century is that that's exactly the wrong picture of what happened. And on the contrary, almost all the good ideas that I've ever had, there aren't very many of them, have happened in the process of deliberating, communicating, exchanging, and so on. So working with students, especially PhD students, and working with teams to organise and put on and interpret and plan and discuss exhibitions and work in museums, working with groups around broadcasting and radio, television and so on. All of that has been or provided me with the places where and the opportunities to actually find out new stuff. And on the contrary, the arrow almost points in the opposite direction counterintuitively. It points from the museum to the study. It points from the supervision to the article. It points from the television program to the book, not the other way around. Um, and in retrospect, that's really what I spent the last 25 years doing, um, television. I started working around television and history of science uh, fairly early. In fact, when I was in London, when I moved to London in 1980, which was a period, I mean, politically catastrophic period, of course, for the country. Um, but it was also, the law of unintended consequences applies here, the cultural period that future historians will describe as early Channel 4. That's to say, miraculously, for reasons that I think we still don't understand, um, government in association with certain interests in media and elsewhere had invented a system of making tele commissioning and making television programmes which was unprecedentedly liberal and unprecedentedly expansive and unprecedentedly well-funded, which was how the early Channel 4 franchises worked. And one of my former Cambridge allies and comrades, Bob Young, had managed to persuade Central Television, as it then was, to um, run a series on science. There was no science slot in early Channel 4, and Central Television, based in Birmingham, uh, bid for and won the franchise for that, with a huge budget, with initially a dozen programme slots, each one hour, broken by advertising, hence the money. And Bob Young took over the whole programme series, it was called Crucible. He commissioned his mates and allies to each make a programme, and many of them were extremely powerful, effective and distinguished. Donna Haraway, for example, then not the uh, uh, key thinker that she subsequently became, but an absolutely vibrant and brilliant young historian of biology, actually, at that point, um, feminist, made an extraordinary programme a classic, I think, of television science on primatology and on the way in which apes were studied by humans in confined spaces, often in Caribbean islands, and it wasn't clear who was studying whom, and uh, some really marvellous footage and brilliantly edited. I was asked to make a programme about Newton, 
with essentially unlimited resources. So we did that. It was called Portraits of Newton. It was extremely good fun. Um, I learned how to talk to camera. I learned what you could and could not do in an hour. I learned about shooting ratios that it would take you a day or more to make three or four minutes of broadcastable footage. It was still the steam age of television. Um, so editing was done in a suite using a steam bag and scissors, essentially me mechanized scissors. Mm -hmm. I was uniquely privileged because the director producer was a marvelous man called Lawrence Moore. Genius, I think, real genius. Um, and also ridiculously tolerant. He was, a, he was prepared to let the talent, that's me, that's the, <laughs> that's the jargon word, sit with the editors, which has never happened to me since, anywhere, ever. Um, and that was really a treat and a privilege, and of course had a huge difference. And the film, Portraits of Newton, is a, an attempt to summarise what I think about the way in which the reputation of a great scientist is made in culture and changes and is mutable and the way in which iconography helps you understand history and vice versa and I learned as I say all sorts of techniques and tricks that then carried on through the 80s and 90s um, and I got involved in various television projects uh, which were astonishingly rewarding intellectually. The most important of them, by far, was a series that I worked on with um, Alan McFarlane and uh, with Chris Cullen and with Maxine Berg and Joel Mokir and others, but entirely under the aegis of someone who I think really changed the way I work, Jerry Martin. Um, Jerry, in many ways, stands for the argument that I'm trying to make here. He stands for the idea that trying to communicate is the same as making knowledge. So, Jerry, um, it's hard to summarise, um, and since he's no longer with, it, with us, it's also rather sad. Um, I got to know Jerry again to illustrate the thesis, through museum work. Um, my department in Cambridge has one of the best collections of scientific instruments and books in the world, the Whipple Museum. It was endowed by the then manager of the Cambridge Scientific Instrument Company, one of the neglected glories of Cambridge, um, and Mr. Robert Whipple, who on his retirement began to collect, when one could, we're in the interwar period, astonishing objects and books. And not just the classic paraphernalia, as it were, objects of virtue of past science, but really a very acute eye and taste. In 1944, when you might have thought people had their minds on other things, Whipple left the whole collection to the university. Initially, the university had no idea what to do such a collection and the department grew up in the 50s around the museum not the other way around it's worthy of note that both in oxford and in cambridge scholarship in the history of science grew up around the great museum collections not the other way around and one could think about the analogy there with the development of cognate disciplines like anthropology um, so in the very same gesture, tragically one might say, one had a discipline that was increasingly neglecting material culture, developing around an institution which held all the resources to make material culture front and centre of one's work, and I think that tension remains. The uh, greatest curator of the Whipple Museum by far is a man called Jim Bennett, who now runs the um, Old Dashmolium, the History of Science Museum at Oxford, charming, witty, brilliant um, instrument historian, historian of astronomy, um, who, a brilliant teacher as well, who'd organised a series of exhibitions 
and publications around the Whipple collection, which I and my students very enthusiastically took part in. And it was through Jim's work with those projects that we met Jerry Martin, um, a wealthy, entirely self-effacing um, catalyst of innumerable initiatives, projects and programs that he would simultaneously launch, start, provoke, direct, and yet, in a certain sense, disappear from. Um, and that puckish role that Jerry gave himself was, I think, one of the keys to his success. Simultaneously, um, absolutely down there with the work, and yet so modest, and so delightfully puzzled and quizzical, about the performances that the court jesters would put on that um, one realised all the time that the best one could do was not good enough. I mean, I've never met anyone who provoked ever more intense, ever more energetic, ever more committed work without once being offensive or rude or in any way dictatorial. Um, it was a kind of Aristotelian pattern, right? Jerry provided this ever slightly receding goal towards which one was supposed to move. Rather than pushing you or forcing you in any direction, he would simply move the goal a few microns further on. And you suddenly realise that where you thought you'd completed the task, this was only the beginning. And working on the exhibitions that he helped sponsor, this is in the mid-90s, was an I.O for me, for the reasons I've begun to sketch. First of all, it radically changed the kinds of questions that I wanted to ask. This was a set of exhibitions that Jerry almost entirely funded around science, especially physical science, as it was in Britain and Germany a hundred years ago. We had all the resources to put on these shows. Um, he gave us the funding to really make those exhibitions work. It completely reoriented the direction of my research towards questions like science and imperialism, uh, Victorian technology and material culture, the absolutely crucial role of standards, measurement, standardization, metrology, the significance of the trained eye, the importance of what Jerry thought of as those remarkable feedback loops that industrial society managed to develop between reliable knowledge and, as he always put it, moving matter around. Um, all of this, I think, revolutionised the historiography of 19th century science and technology. Um, and he was the prime mover, but as I say, teleologically rather than efficiently. Um, simultaneously, he was um, working with and sponsoring a loosely structured uh, community, a family almost, of scholars and others around the theme of innovation and discovery, the problem of genius, uh, which met annually, sometimes biannually, um, involved e economists, historians, anthropologists, historians of science. It enabled me to meet people I would never otherwise have met and constantly bringing us back to basics, often by using a Gladstone bag with which he would arrive at a meeting full of goodies from Neolithic tools to late 19th century treasures, simply to make sure that you, as it were, kept your mental feet on the ground, that was one thing, but also because they provoke. Um, the principal lesson I learned from Jerry around material culture is that no object is so powerful that it means the same everywhere. And no object is so weak that how you describe it defines what it's for. And that seemed to unlock all sorts of research and expository and exhibitionary possibilities. And it also meant for the people I was working with most closely in Cambridge, PhD students and postdocs, the forging of a real intellectual community, in, in some ways the most important community I've ever worked with between 
the late 80s and the late 90s for a decade, we had here a very impressive, very productive, dynamic group of scholars. Um, young, bright, eccentric, working on the history of the physical sciences in the 18th, 19th and 20th centuries, who've gone on to great success um, in Europe, Britain and the States. Um, my work, in a certain sense, entirely simply tracks what they were doing. Um, so the articles and I've written, books I've edited and collaborated on are essentially commentaries on and responses to this sort of work that they were doing. When um, Chapin and I had the privilege of going to the Netherlands for the award of the Erasmus Prize in the autumn of 2005, I was very keen that this group of people be there too. And a very substantial number of them actually came, I think partly because there was an invitation to a palace, which yeah. we hadn't had before, and partly because the catering in Amsterdam is, of course, extremely good in all, in all sorts of ways. Uh, Jim Bennett came, um, a lot of PhD students and former PhD students. It was a remarkable gathering. My principal regret was that Jerry wasn't there, um, because I think he would have found it hilarious. Slightly embarrassing, of course, but hilarious. Um, linked to that, then, are two themes that I think the work depended on. Um, again, broadcasting, which I find extremely entertaining and very frustrating simultaneously. So the project which I worked with Alan and Maxine and Joel and Chris on which had Jerry as the um, strange attractor. And, and David Dugan and as the producer. David Dugan as the producer-director, another, I think, media genius. Mm. Um, in terms of making space and opportunity for the performing sea lions to do their thing, I mean, David is really remarkable. And he cares, which I've subsequently discovered is a rare virtue in that industry. This was a series called The Day the World Took Off, six one-hour television programs. Um, Alan and Jerry contributed enormously to that um, because they dreamt up a scheme and a set of questions that I think unusually well organized and focused what would otherwise have been an entirely centrifugal activity. Um, the idea, for example, of moving backwards chronologically that that series embodies and of moving outwards from a point to the universe. So the first program was on the events between Manchester and Liverpool around the first journey of the rocket. Um, all the way to uh, the last program, which was about the agricultural revolutions of antiquity and prehistory and their global consequences. That seemed absolutely genial to me. And one reason why it was obviously smart is that's how historians actually make their claims. Um, they don't begin with abstract universal theory from which they then, using the hypothetical deductive method, derive a particular consequence for a particular instance in a particular place and time. It seems to me great historians are all casuists. They make the instances which they've mastered and which they've analysed exquisitely count backwards, genealogically as it were, as telling lessons for much more global questions. Um, it's worth remembering, after all, that the word teoria originally meant um, the activity of going away and coming back and telling your citizens what you saw and learnt. So Herodotus, if a traveller, which he probably was, was a theoretician. He brought theory home from the world to the city. Um, theory is absolutely about voyaging, journeying to elsewhere, to alien places, and learning and systematizing particular bits of almost atomic experience 
and then putting them, <coughs> excuse me, and then putting them back together. And the work that we did for the day the world took off, and the handful of other programs that I've been involved in that I'm proud of, is exactly like that. Because the pressure there is always on the telling in both senses. And weaving the telling into a set of images and noises that then hint at and, and imply a much more global narrative. So you were, you were involved in a, another series on light, mm. weren't, weren't you? Was that important? That was important and, um, again, an, an object lesson. Um, this was work for the BBC in uh, 2001, 2002, 2003. Um, two things there. I mean, one was, um, there's an old Australian expression, you can't win it if you're not in it. You have to pronounce it like that, I guess. <laughs> Which means um, you're not allowed to criticise or judge or comment unless you're a player. Um, this is a, an expression that comes, of course, from cricket. <laughs> um, so grumbling about the public face of the sciences and especially the way folk tell stories about the past and the development of the sciences is fine provided in a way you've paid your dues and a, about five or six years ago I was really keen to see if as it were I could make something like a television project I could take part in a television project which expressed not only some stories that I wanted to tell, but also a way of telling them that um, I was pleased with. And fortunately, entirely out of the blue, I was contacted by a team from the BBC um, who were after making a uh, quite large-scale series, perhaps four hours, four programmes, on optics. And um, I found in conversation with the various producers who were involved, especially the principal producer, Paul Sen, who remains a close personal friend um, and is a very important producer of science documentaries, that there was a possible scheme here, not to do something on optics, but to do something precisely on light, because that would broaden and deepen the scope of what we might want to talk about. The other important experience there was to rethink yet again the nature of chronology and of chronological narrative in thinking about the development of the sciences and scientific knowledge. So what we did for uh, the, this series was to choose a series of overlapping chronologies. So rather than move from the beginning of all things to uh, Hiroshima, um, we constructed it as a series of interlocking stories um, <clears throat> so that each program went back over some material in the previous program but from a completely different point of view. The program of those that I'm most proud of for sure is the one on electric light. There was an obvious reflexivity about this, in that if, if there's a sense that if, if you can't make a television program about light, <laughs> then you can't make a television program about anything. And uh, very skilled producers and editors played with that, I thought, wonderfully well, especially the material on Edison and the Second Industrial Revolution, the development of a power and light system in late 19th century Europe and North America, so that the iconography of the film is part of the argument the coming into being of that way of seeing, of that kind of illumination, which I'm describing verbally, is also very much what you're seeing playfully on the screen. And I'm very proud of the way we did that. Um, we were also very lucky because the program happened to coincide with one of the greatest contemporary art exhibits I've seen uh, recently, which is Olafur Eliasson's Weather Project at Tate Modern, um, which essentially made the entire argument of 
this series in one installation. Um, uh, vapor hanging in the turbine hall with a vast number of light bulbs um, creating the image of the sun. <coughs> Sand spread over part of the floor. Um, but also mirrors to concentrate and diffuse the various kinds of light. And without planning, Londoners treated it like the beach. <laughs> so that when one visited, there were literally hundreds of prone bodies lying down in front of this artificial sun inside, check it out, <laughs> a turbine hall. So that... Um, everything I wanted to say about light, culture, urbanity, art, power and light, electric generators was all co-present in this room, in this thing. And that really makes the, the principal point that I want to make about what I learned from working with David Ugan and Jerry Martin and Alan and others and Jim Bennett and my colleagues, which is, it is possible to make <clears throat> very complicated ideas into material objects and then to reflect literally on those material objects to extract new, better, refined ideas and models and theories. That had absolutely not been obvious to me before throwing myself into all this work. <clears throat> it's culminated um, in being offered the chance of becoming a trustee of the National Museum of Science and Industry, which I now am, um, which is again a, an eye-opening experience um, to see from that point of view behind the scenes of the museum. This is the most important uh, science and technology museum in Europe and one of the two or three most important in the world, um, which has had interesting and often troubled history. Um, which has many different functions, communicating science and technology, um, enrolling public interest in the sciences, um, a vast uh, biomedical collection as well as the classic technology and science collections, um, based on three or four major sites including the National Media Museum at Bradford and the National Railway Museum in York. Um, a fascinating learning experience for me and I'm one of the first historians of science, if not the first historian of science, to be a trustee. So that's given me an enormous amount to think about and it's an area where from, for the next few years anyway I'll be doing a lot of work. Related to this of course is the theme of the museum. Um, it's through the museum and the public exhibition that my work with my maître à penser in Paris, Bruno Latour, has been most pursued. Um, Latour has become the most famous, the, the best known exponent of something like science studies, science and technology studies, um, over the last decade. The usual principle that uh, no one interprets work the same way twice applies in spades to Bruno's work. Um, his principle that meaning is in the hands of future users applies spectacularly to what he's done. So my impression of him and his work is radically different from that of many of my colleagues. Um, I met him first in Bath in 1980. We stayed in touch. My regular trips to Paris for research brought me in contact with him. He was the first person actually, to take the book that I did with Steve Shaping seriously, though his interpretation of it differs very radically from mine or from Steve's. Um, he uh, was trained as a theologian and an anthropologist and a philosopher. Marvellous combination, maybe not that different from Léry's. Um, he's by no means a politically radical figure, on the contrary, um, there's a very profound uh, um, Gallican Catholicism in Latour's work, which simply doesn't make it 
to Anglo-Saxon, I mean, it's invisible here and in the States, but it's absolutely visible in France. And um, it needs to be respected as a very important component of his work. Um, he was based for a very substantial period of his career at the uh, School of Mines, um, which tells you a great deal about how French intellectual, left bank intellectual life works. The School of Mines hosts a center for the sociology of innovation, which is kind of a Jerry Martin title, if, if one wants, where with his colleagues, especially with Michel Callon, Bruno developed an unbelievably powerful, uh, falsifiable but powerful project to analyze how the sciences are pursued, science in action with a vocabulary and an armamentarium one could easily use oneself. The contrast between his approach and those of some of his Anglo-American colleagues is perhaps too harshly drawn. Um, the aims to completely reconstruct the social sciences on this basis perhaps again slightly too ambitious. But as an intellectual He's one of the major figures that the revolution in our understanding of the sciences has produced in the last 25 years. And his work is indispensable for any adequate account of how science, technology, society are for us now at this critical period. Personally, he's one of the most charming people I've ever met. Absurdly hospitable, genteel, courteous, and of course, generous example. In um, the late 80s, early 90s, I wrote and published an article which was somewhat critical of one of his masterpieces, a book which in French is called The Microbes, War and Peace, and in English is called The Pasteurization of France. And I compared what Bruno was doing in this project which is an analysis, amongst many other things, of the reasons for the success of Louis Pasteur from 1848 into the 1880s with the analysis that Marx gave in the 18th Brumaire of the reasons for the success of Louis Napoleon between 1848 and later. Um, and uh, Bruno, I think unlike many senior colleagues in our field, responded to this paper by coming to Cambridge with the very best of his family's wine. I mean, the, the, the best white wine I've ever drunk, which of course we couldn't drink on the spot because it had been shaken up by the journey, and sat with me for a couple of days talking through what I meant and what it meant for him. And I thought that was an act of intellectual honesty and rigor that you don't often find. And he's been like that with me and with his closest colleagues always. He's also massively committed to making sure the work we all do is public work. And I respect that enormously. We are not dealing with an obscurantist or a cherche uh, figure who wraps up his arguments in a jargon that only the croyant can follow. That is not what is going on here. So, for example, in collaboration with uh, Peter Weibel uh, in uh, Germany at uh, the Centre for Culture and Media in Karlsruhe, Bruno has organised two astonishing public exhibitions, which he's mobilised a lot of his colleagues and friends to take part in. And again, remarkable uh, knowledge-producing, culture-producing activities, um, what he calls assemblages, which I think are some of the most exciting projects that I've ever worked on and in. Um, so although we never quite agree, we're never quite on the same uh, wavelength, the interference between the different forms of radiation that we all broadcast has been provided me with some of the most productive and interesting public as well as academic activities in which I've been engaged. He's also a model, as is Steve Shapin, 
for how to deal with trainees, with students. A balance that's always very difficult to strike, of course, especially, I think, in the field of science studies, of history of science, where um, there is no background that is irrelevant, no former experience that can't pay off for one's work in this field, and therefore, perversely, no one is qualified to speak. Um, so the activity of training and collaborating with students is endlessly analytic and open-ended to a degree that I think is unusual in comparison with other fields. Um, should one have a qualification in the sciences? Of course. Should one know the languages of learning, Arabic, Chinese, Latin, Greek, of course. Should one uh, be able to uh, master paleography? Absolutely. Should one make sure that one's cases are drawn not just from, as it were, Britain, but also from elsewhere in uh, industrial society? And indeed, of course, one has to respect indigenous forms of knowledge in uh, uh, many other parts of the world. Yes, absolutely, that's completely indispensable. Um, so, although the age of the polyhistor is past, we're supposed to be like that. And that raises extraordinarily interesting, but also intractable questions about how you train anyone to do the sort of work that we find interesting um, and valuable. Similarly, um, the way in which students are always collaborators too, in the case of Chapin and Latour, I've learned a lot about how that can be and is in our field. And finally, the virtues of simplicity, which I admire in those two men's writings, but have never managed to emulate myself.